we're going to do chapter 18 here. Today we'll be continuing Rainbow Valley by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 18. Mary Brings Evil Tidings. What? Something is making a noise. What just happened? Mary Vance, whom Mrs. Elliot had sent up to the manse on an errand, came tripping down Rainbow Valley on her way to Ingleside, where she was to spend the afternoon with Nan and Di as a Saturday treat. Nan and Di had been pricking... pricking. Nan and Di had been picking spruce scrum... Oh my god... Nan and Di had been picking spruce gum with Faith and Una in the manse woods, and the four of them were now sitting on a fallen pine by the brook, all, it must be admitted, chewing rather vigorously. The Ingleside twins were not allowed to chew... chew. The Ingleside twins were not allowed to chew spruce gum anywhere but in the seclusion of Rainbow Valley, but Faith and Una were unrestricted by such rules of etiquette and cheerfully chewed it everywhere, at home and abroad, to the very proper horror of the Glen. Faith had been chewing it in church one day, but Jerry had realized the enormity of that, and had given her such an older brotherly scolding that she never did it again. I was so hungry. It just felt... I was so hungry. I just felt as if I had to chew something, she protested. You know well enough what breakfast was like, Jerry Meredith. I couldn't eat scorched porridge, and my stomach just felt so queer and empty. The gum helped a lot, and I didn't chew very hard. I didn't make any noise, and I never cracked the gum once. Speaking of which, now I'm remembering that that's what I used to use when I needed... Some kind of a sweet treat. I would chew gum. You mustn't chew gum in church anyhow, insisted Jerry. Don't let me catch you at it again. You chewed yourself in prayer meeting last week, cried Faith. That's different, said Jerry loftily. Prayer meeting isn't on Sunday. Besides, I sat away at the back in a dark seat and nobody saw me. You were sitting right up front where everyone saw you and I took the gum out of my mouth for the last hymn and stuck it on the back of the pew right up in front where everyone saw you. Then I came away and forgot it. I went back to get it next morning, but it was gone. I suppose Rod Warren swiped it, and it was a dandy chew. Mary Vance walked down the valley with her head held high. She had on a new blue velvet cap with a scarlet rosette in it, a coat of navy blue cloth, and a little squirrel fur muff. She was very conscious of her new clothes, and very well pleased with herself. Her hair was elaborately crimped. Her face was quite plump, her cheeks rosy, her white eyes shining. She did not look much like the forlorn and ragged waif the Meredith had found in the old tailor barn. Una tried not to feel envious. Here was Mary, with a new velvet cap, but she and Faith had to wear their shabby old gray tams again this winter. Nobody ever thought of getting them new ones, and they were afraid to ask their father for fear. And they were afraid to ask their father for fear that he might be short of money, and then they would feel badly. Mary had told them once that ministers were always short of money, and found it awful hard to make ends meet. Since then, Faith and Una would have gone in rags rather than ask their father for anything if they could help it. They did not worry a great deal over their shabbiness, but it was rather trying to see Mary Vance coming out in such style and putting on such airs about it, too. The new squirrel muff was really the last straw. Neither Faith nor Una had ever had a muff, counting themselves lucky if they could come... counting themselves lucky if they could compass mittens without holes in them. Aunt Martha could not see to darn holes. 
and though Una tried to, she made sad cobbling. Somehow they could mu- Somehow they could not make their greeting of Mary very cordial, but Mary did not mind or notice that. She was not overly sensitive. She vaulted lightly to a seat on the pine tree and laid the offending muff on a bough. Una saw that it was lined with shirred red satin and had red tassels. She looked down at her own rather purple chapped little hands and wondered if she would ever, ever be able to put them into a muff like that. Give us a chew, said Mary companionably. Nan, Di, and Faith all produced an amber-hued knot or two from their pockets and passed them to Mary. Una sat very still. She had four lovely big knots in the pocket of her tight, threadbare little jacket, but she wasn't going to give one of them to Mary Vance. Not one. Let Mary pick her own gum. People with squirrel muffs needn't expect to get everything in the world. Great day, isn't it? said Mary, swinging her legs. The better, perhaps, to display new boots with smart cloth tops. Una tucked her feet under her. There was a hole in the toe of one of her boots, and both laces were much knotted. But they were the best she had. Oh, this Mary Vance. Why hadn't they left her in the old barn? Una never felt badly, because the Ingleside twins were better dressed than she and Faith were. Una never felt badly because the Ingleside twins were better dressed than she and Faith were. They wore their pretty clothes with careless grace and never seemed to think about them at all. Somehow they did not make other people feel shabby. But when Mary Vance was dressed up, she seemed fairly to exude clothes, to walk in an atmosphere of clothes, to make everybody else feel and think clothes. Una, as she sat there in the honey-tinted sunshine of the gracious December afternoon, was acutely and miserably conscious of everything she had on. The faded tam, which was yet her best, the skimpy jacket she had worn for three winters, the holes in her skirt and her boots, the shivering insufficiency of her poor little undergarments. Of course, Mary was going out for a visit, and she was not. But even if she had been, she had nothing better to put on, and in this lay the sting. Say, this is great gum. Listen to me cracking it. There ain't any gum spruces down at Four Winds, said Mary. Sometimes I just hanker after a chew. Mrs. Elliot won't let me chew gum if she sees me. She says it ain't ladylike. This lady business puzzles me. I can't get on to all its kinks. Say, Una, what's the matter with you? Cat got your tongue? No, said Una, who could not drag her fascinated eyes from that squirrel muff. Mary leaned past her, picked it up and thrust it into Una's hands. Stick your paws in that for a while, she ordered. They look sort of pinched. Ain't that a dandy muff? Mrs. Elliot gave it to me last week for a birthday present. I'm to get the collar at Christmas. I heard her telling Mr. Elliot that. Mrs. Elliot is very good to you, said Faith. You bet she is. And I'm good to her, too, retorted Mary. I work like a nigger to make it easy for her and have everything just as she likes it. We was made for each other. Don't like that this is a normal word used. Tisn't everyone could get along with her as well as I do. She's pissin' neat. But so am I, and so we... But so am I, and so we agree fine. I told you she would never whip you. So you did. She's never tried to lay a finger on me. And I ain't never told a lie to her. Not one trues you live. She combs me down with her tongue sometimes, though. But that just slips off me like water off a duck's back. Say, Una, why didn't you hang on to the muff? Una had put it back on the bow. My hands aren't cold. Thank you, she said stiffly. Well, if you're satisfied, I am. Say, old Kitty Alec has come back to church as meek as Moses, and nobody knows why. But everybody's saying it was Faith brought Norman Douglas out. His housekeeper says you went there and gave him an awful tongue lashing. Did you? 
I went and asked him to come to church, said Faith uncomfortably. Fancy. I'm pretty sure it's my, like, tree stand thing that is making noise. Fan yeah, there it is. Fancy your spunk, said Mary admiringly. I wouldn't have dared do that, and I'm not so slow. Mrs. Wilson says the two of you jawed something scandalous, but you come off best, and then he just turned round and liked to eat you up. Say, is your father going to preach here tomorrow? No, he is going to exchange with Mr. Perry from Charlottetown. Father went to town this morning, and Mr. Perry's coming out tonight. I thought there was something in the wind, though old Martha wouldn't give me any satisfaction, but I felt sure she wouldn't have been killing that rooster for nothing. What rooster? What do you mean? cried Faith, turning pale. I don't know what rooster. I didn't see it. When she took the butter Mrs. Elliot sent up, she said she'd been out to the barn killing a rooster for dinner tomorrow. Faith sprang down from the pine. It's Adam. We have no other rooster. She's killed Adam. Now don't fly off the handle. Martha said the butcher at the Glen had no meat this week, and she had to have something, and the hens were all laying in too poor. If she has killed Adam... Faith began to run up the hill. Mary shrugged her shoulders. She'll go crazy now. She was so fond of that Adam. He ought to have been in the pot long ago. He'll be as tough as sole leather, but I wouldn't like to be in Martha's shoes. Faith just white with rage. Una, you'd better go after her and try to peacify her. Mary had gone a few steps with the Blythe girls when Una suddenly turned and ran after her. Here's some gum for you, Mary, she said, with a little repentant catch in her voice, thrusting all her four knots into Mary's hands. And I'm glad you have such a pretty muff. Why, thanks, said Mary, rather taken by surprise. To the Blythe girls, after Una had gone, she said, Ain't she a queer little mite? But I've always said she had a good heart. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Brie Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of Rainbow Valley. I had to do a bunch of blocking someone on social media today, so that was fun. Um, of course, there's always the chance that, you know, they know about all the things. Um, some people are just rude for no reason. And I, personally, would rather block them so that I don't have to see their rudeness. Or don't have it directed towards me anymore. Regardless, um, I deal with enough rude stuff from audiobooks, and for the most part, the podcast is received well, so I must have found the right people. Anyways, I'm starting a new audiobook today, which I am excited. I was supposed to work on it yesterday, but with the power, our power was out for a large portion of the day, so that could not happen, unfortunately. So we are back at it today. All right. Thanks, guys.